please don't make me do it. Good. Cool. So this is the culmination of this section. <clears throat> and we're going to finish out CFA by looking at full, full structural models. I always feel weird because I want to say full sim models, but that's like full model models, so full structural equation models. So a fully latent model, or we'll see people call it a full structural model, has two parts. The measurement model, which is generally considered the CFA part, and the structural model, which is the part where you are um, predicting pieces, usually the latent variables on the measurement model. So you have how you're measuring your latents, and then the predictions on those latents. So in theory, our hierarchical models we did last week are technically full structural models because we had an extra latent variable predicting the measurement models. So the second structural model may be our second order latent like we did last week, but it also could include other predictors. So you can use measured covariates. Sometimes these are called mimic models, multiple indicators, multiple causes, where I have maybe like gender, or income or something else that predicts our latent variable. Because remember, most of our latent variables are reflexive, so they're exogenous, but now that would make them Y and be endogenous. Okay. Or we can simply convert from correlations to a specific prediction pattern. So instead of adding that, that second order component, we basically might say, well, latent one actually predicts latent two in my theory. So this really is going to be a kind of a, hopefully a simple transition because we're moving from um, having those predictions that we did in our <clears throat> second order models last week to adding other variables that are doing the predictions instead. So here's an example. We might have um, the measurement models over here, externalizing and internalizing. And then this measurement model, although the bubble is very large in this um, article. And so we've got essentially three factors that we, instead of having them just be correlated, um, theorize the prediction on them. So that makes it a full model, and this is the structural component right here. The measurement component down here is at the bottom. So a reminder, our reflexive or reflective indicators uh, assume that the latent variables are the cause. So they're exogenous, where the, the prediction is only going out. A formative indicator is where we assume the latent variables are the criterion, or Y, so they're endogenous. And we're actually going to be able to program some formative indicators this week. I think we talked about this like in the first or second terminology week, and since then we haven't touched it, so we're going to come back to this idea. So an example of a formative indicator from before, we talked about um, socioeconomic status is sort of a measure of all these different um, ideas. So income, education level, occupation might predict my socioeconomic status, where I live, right? Because some areas of the country are more expensive than others, AKA the Northeast um, and, and California, all, all of California. Right? Um, we could say build a variable called stress because it's not that my st stress predicts things, it's that these things combined are stress. So like politics, <laughs> um, computer program problems, what else this week? Uh, COVID, okay, that would have all combined together might predict my stress. And people often sometimes call these things composite causes, because okay, you're building a composite variable or um, a mimic. Um, multiple indicators, multiple cause models. Okay. Because you're saying there are several causal reasons why this why is happening, as opposed to one latent variable that is the cause for all of them. Because we flip the direction of our prediction. So there's an example, I think, from the Klein book. This is our traditional reflective indicator that we've been doing, and these are the composite ones. Okay, now composite latent variables do take up more degrees of freedom because we have to estimate the variances for one, two, three, four things. So one, two, three, four. 
we have to estimate the covariances between our exogenous only predictors. So one, two, three. And all of these, minus the one here, so four, five. Versus just the variances, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, things over, wait, okay, hold on. One, two, three, four variances, five, six uh, uh, latent variable coefficients. Over here, we've got one, two, three, four variances. That isn't changing. Five, six, seven with the covariances, eight, nine with our um, regressions. So they do take up more degrees of freedom and they're more difficult to make identify. Okay. So speaking of identification, our latent variables, we've done this slide like three or four times. It's just like a constant reminder. They should have four indicators or they should have three indicators and their error variances don't co-vary. Or they have two indicators Error variances don't co-vary, and the loadings are set equal to each other. Now, we've gotten away with latent variables with only two indicators without any problems, okay, because it's kind of, we've uh, kind of distributed the identification across them. Um, but you'll see one go wrong on the assignment. But the bigger issue is that the structural model part also has to have identification and scaling. So when you do the um, in-class assignment part for this, I have a section that said, oh no, you don't have identification. Here's how you fix it. So we'll, in that assignment, you'll step through one that you'll code one way, and then it won't work, and then I will tell you how to fix it. And mainly what this is, if I can back up, to our picture while wow, it's further back than I thought here okay. you're going to build this kind of model and these are technically regressions because we're predicting that direction but um, you have to kind of trick the model and code these as 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 if you were doing a higher order um, model because um, otherwise it won't scale at this level so what I mean by that is we could use y is approximated by x, right? So we could say child externalizing single tilde is parental predicted by parental self-occupation. Okay. And then on a second line, we could say child internalizing tilde this parental occupation because that's how that regression works. Okay. But then it has no idea how to scale the structural component because we don't have any kind of marker variable or we haven't scaled on the latent variable, it just, just kind of doesn't know what to do. So the solution is to pretend like this is a latent, like this is the latent variable for these two. Okay, so what you do is parental occupation equals tilde child plus child. And you'll see that on the assignment. All right. And so that's the um, Scaling is required at the structural level part. And the 2 plus admitted path rule is that a composite variable, specifically for our formative indicators here, must have direct effects on two other endogenous variables. Or you won't be able to, they won't run. If you go back to the very beginning of the semester, I have an example of one that actually is not really running properly. I just was like, don't actually look at the numbers here, but this is how this looks and we'll get to them later. <clears throat> so here's the later. Um, and they have to have um, arrows going out. Okay. Um, so it has to have effects on at least two other endogenous variables. Okay. So some things to consider. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about parceling, even though I'll basically tell you not to do it. Okay, what is parceling? Well, when you have very large structural models, so let's say you have hundreds of questions or indicators or measured variables, it can be really complex to fit because you have then hundreds of parameters to estimate. So if a latent variable has a lot of indicators or items, it can be really tricky to then also fit the structural component of the model. So what parceling does is creates these little subsets so essentially you kind of reduce the number of measured items down because you create these little subgroups 
by combining them together. That helps kind of the model run and balance out the number of indicators. So if you have one latent variable that has like 100 indicators and one latent variable that has 10, okay, that can be tricky. So you might average out very similar indicators on our big latent variable. And so that's called parceling. And it's pretty, it's considered sometimes controversial. There's like the parceling camp and the not parceling camp. And I mostly fall in the not parceling camp. Um, still pretty controversial to do. I think there's some other things you can do instead, like create the measurement model and then grab the latent mean. So one thing we haven't really discussed because we're saving it for multi-group models is from your model, you know, you get your latent variable. We haven't really talked about how do I know what the score for that variable is. So we can use a function called lav predict to actually create scores for all of our all of our data points. So we can um, essentially create the, that predictor. And that's really useful for multi-group models when we're trying to determine if, like, let's say men and women have different latent scores. And so one solution to this might be to create the latent scores separately and then use them as measured items. And that's got its own problems. So parceling is still kind of controversial, but it can be a solution to models that have almost too many variables. So what I tell you to do is to test each measurement model separately, see if it runs. Um, because sometimes the problem isn't that you have too many variables, the problem is that you have bad variables, <laughs> you know, so find each CFA and make sure it runs. And if those CFA are, CFAs are bad, you either have to fix them or disregard the whole thing. Because adding the structural component does not suddenly make it a good model. Generally what we've seen when we add these structural paths, uh, like last week, is that mostly the model doesn't change. You're just specifying the causal direction. So slowly add the structural paths to see if you can get it to work. And if all of that fails, then try parceling. The other thing you can do is drop some non-significant paths because they're not doing you any good. So significance is sort of a tricky subject in SEM. Um, actually, I'm in like this idea of uh, this working group that talks about these kinds of things, which is super nerdy. But it's just like what makes a path important, right? Because we have to have these really large sample sizes for, for structural models. Well, we don't, but we should have large sample sizes to get a good representation of the data. And at those large sample sizes, it's a catch-22 because that means that almost always the paths are significant. So when I say drop non-significant paths here, I might mean that drop the paths that are very close to zero. Do I have a number for that? No. That's what we're discussing. <laughs> Um, but things that are very small um, are not really improving the model any. And sometimes by eliminating them, you can get a model to work. By work, I mean converge. It may not be a very good model. So here when we say that models run or they work, we mean that they literally don't give you errors. Um, what makes a model good is a different question. All right, so as we add these structural components, unless we're adding new variables, okay, as we're adding new variables, things can move around a little bit. So let's say you add a, an outside predictor. But in general, as we add these structural components, the measurement level, right, the CFA level, should not change that much. Okay. So we really shouldn't see a big change in the loadings. Okay, we might see changes in the fit indices, because, uh, depending on what you're doing. But in general, though, the measurement level, so what I mean by that is the CFA part, shouldn't change that much. If it does, that means the model is not invariant. And I hate this phrase because it's kind of a double negative, but invariance is a good thing. That means the, the measurement component of the model is not changing um, based on the other things in the model. And that's what you want. You want good measurement, <laughs> meaning that we've, we've measured this and it is what it is. Now we can predict that measurement, but it's not like the measurement tool suddenly changes based on what day it is. 
So think about thermometers, right? You want those to just measure temperature. You don't want them to change suddenly because it's Wednesday and we've decided that Wednesdays are weird. So a model that is invariant is good. A model that is not invariant is bad. And that idea we're going to cover a whole lot more in our multi-group section. We're going to do just uh, a whole bunch of stuff on this idea of invariance because it's a really interesting scale question. Do the different types of people or um, different types of measurement tools provide the same answers? And the answer is sometimes, but it's good to know if they don't. And anytime the model is not invariant, it does cause interpretation difficulties. So for example, we um, I work with a group that studies um, people after natural disasters. And their, their work is so cool. I've talked about it often on this semester. But um, one thing that we've looked at is how people respond to these scales. And a paper that we published a while back looked at the resiliency scale that we used in examples. And we find that, P, that um, white participants and black participants, because this is Mississippi, so you got a lot of you know, all those types of people, not much else. Um, answer these questions differently right? and that impacts our interpretation of their scores and then when we get to multi-group models we'll talk more about that because it's one of the examples that I have okay. so um, you want to make sure if, if people if the measurement models do change you at least understand why now often a full structural model is um, a bit of an exploration, not always, but sometimes. So when do you stop? Okay. So we've talked a lot about using modification indices and these other kind of tricks to improve model fit, right? So I can um, delete things that don't don't do me any good. I can, um, when we have Haywood cases, we can kind of like convince the model to still work. <laughs> we can add new paths, but when do I stop? Okay. So in theory, we could add all the possible paths and so we'd end up with a just identified model or degrees of freedom equals zero until the model's perfect okay, don't do that but what should a good stopping rule be right and I, I I was just actually working on a paper where uh I was like okay why did we do this many <laughs> I was trying I should have written it down but it should be based on theory and theory, by theory, if you're talking about like at work, at a business, it should be based on like past practices, that kind of thing, um, as long as the past practices aren't also bad. But um, for our case, it was based on um, all those items were on the same factor. So it made sense that their um, question correlations were, uh, were uh, related, right? So the error terms were related between similar items because they were very similarly worded um, you should stop if the fit indices don't improve because that's the whole point right? and um, parsimony so we always want the simplest model is the best model um, because those are easier to interpret and explain and so I would say that generally you shouldn't just add things uh, just because they have high modification indices you should add things that make sense that also have high modification indices So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to this um, model that I think we ran, oh gosh, I don't even remember anymore, quite some time ago. And we're going to add a, make it, force it to be a structural model instead, okay. just for a simple one. Okay. So this is an example from a book. So all I have is the um, correlation data that I'm going to convert into a covariance matrix. And so for most of our assignments, you have real data. So just import the real data. You would skip this step completely. You would just do um, CFA model equals model, data equals you know imported data. Um, but for many of my examples, I don't have the real data. And I have actually simulated data from this, but it doesn't always work properly. It tends to blow up sometimes. So we're going to go here and we're going to convert the reported data from the Klein data set and just convert everything into a covariance matrix. And what we've got here are um, 
the family of origin, so a little bit of information on the father and the mother and the father's mother. And then we've got how well they are adjusting, so problems in the marriage and intimacy. And this is our traditional measurement model. So we're going to build that first. So just the CFA with us covariances between them. Then we will convert the covariance to a direct regression relationship. And so we'll be merging what we did with path analyses with CFA, and now we're going to put those together. And basically we want to make sure our measurement model doesn't blow up. Let's look. Okay. Pretty simple model. Right? We've got two uh, latent variables, adjustment and family. Just add those up. Okay, we're going to analyze. So here's our model, our sample covariance, and in this case we have 200 participants. And the first thing that happens is that we get this error message. Okay. So we, this is one reason why I've always said this is four steps, right? Build, analyze, summarize, diagram. Because I think if you run too quickly from analyze to summarize, you can miss this message. Because it will give you a summary, and it, if you're not paying enough attention, it looks fine like there are numbers everywhere so it must be fine okay. but you got to make sure you don't skip these warnings okay. so this particular warning is a Haywood case it says the covariance matrix of latent variables is not positive definite okay. and what that means is that um, something is weird somewhere okay. and I'm actually going to tell you don't do law of inspect cove.lv because that doesn't that doesn't help me any, <laughs> right? So if I do that, so I inspect my family dog fit. And you can also do law law of inspect here, but inspect also just works. There's a bunch of, of functions in Levon that have similar names, and I think it's because they wrote some and then liked other names better, but they've left both of them in. So, anyways, this doesn't do anything for me. I have no idea why that's not positive definite. Just looking at those numbers, I'm like, okay, great. Right? So this is a covariance matrix of the latent variables. So this here is the variance of the latent variable, and this is the covariance between them. But we've talked all semester about how covariance is not terribly interpretable. So instead, do core.lv, and then hopefully the problem becomes obvious. Correlations don't go over one. And it has estimated the latent variable correlation between adjustment and family over one. So that's no good. Now there's a couple things we can try here. It's identified, but maybe that's causing some of the problems, um, is that there's only two here. So we could make both of these um, be equal by sending them both to A or B or, you know, coefficient number one. But for some reason, this particular model will actually run if you give it the cor correlation matrix instead of the covariance matrix. Now, if you have the raw data and you have this problem, you have to do other, th other things. <laughs> um, but I don't know why, but for some reason, the way that this one is set up, it just does not run with a covariance matrix. Potentially, that's because, and I can't remember at this point if I made these numbers up or if they're from the book, but mostly I have this example in here to show you what a Haywood case looks like. And you will see one on your assignment. So the, the point of this section is just to talk about Haywood cases. Remember, that's negative variances or correlations over one. Um, you'll see both of those on the homework, actually, on the big assignment. So for some reason, if I switch to correlations, it works fine. Don't know, but it does. I think because maybe my covariances are, are illogical, given the variances. So I probably made it up. And so let's summarize. All right, let's see here. So important rules. All right, let's scroll down. Make sure none of our variances are negative. It will warn you when they are negative, but it's also easy to miss, so just check. None of our R squareds are over 1. None of our correlations are over 1 anymore. Great. 
And then our standard errors are all fairly small. Cool. So model converged con correctly. Let's think about model fit now. And it's bad. It's a bad model. <laughs> and so our CFI and TLFI, TLI are particularly bad. I mean, look at TLI. It's like really bad. Okay. Our RIM-C, NSRMR are no good either. So mostly this model is fairly worthless, but just to, sh just to have a working something to, to get you guys on some practice here. So my interpretation here is that the model is no good, but they at least load together. Right, so looking at our standardized all, we can see that the, the loadings are good for our two factors. Um, there's a fairly moderate correlation between our two factors. So maybe this is a one factor model, but overall, even with these good loadings, and they're significant, um, the model's not very good, would be my interpretation. So I could look at modification indices. Can I improve the model? modification indices on our fitted model. Sort equals true to just put the big ones at the top. And I do have two fairly large ones. Now the suggestion here is to correlate father and mother, which if you look are actually on the same latent variable. That makes sense. The adjustment to um, father's mother here may not make sense because they're on different latent variables. So my choice here would be probably to pick this one because theoretically, at least they're on the same latent variable. We'll see what happens when I do that. So I just tried it. Let's see what happens. I'm going to add that correlated error term between those two because it says that there's a big model misfit. And then I did this on the dot cove. Did I do that wrong? Hmm. So we may, I may have may, uh, no, because I originally did this on the correlation matrix, right? Yeah. So I think, I, I guess I switched back here to the COV instead of the COR, and it gave me that same error message. Okay. So let's see real quick. Um, let me open the markdown file. Maybe that's my mistake. I, I left it out because the model still doesn't run. But maybe. Oh, I also need the data. Derp. Wait, no, the data's embedded. Just kidding. Let's see here. If I change this to the correlation matrix, if that solves it. It may get mad about the pictures here because I don't have those downloaded. What is with R today? Okay, it ran. So let's see what this one does. Okay, so it still gives me the same problem. Right? So I still see that same error. Even if I correct that and do the correlation matrix, I still get this um, not positive definite. So what do we do in this scenario? Right, where it's not really the data, it's now, it's, well, it is the data. <laughs> it's not which data set I'm using, it's, it's just the data. The model itself is not very good. Well, I would probably run the summary. Let me turn on standard, standardized residuals here. Um, good grief. Standardized solution here. And I, I will warn you, it gives you the entire model and all the numbers, but remember, you shouldn't trust these numbers because this is an illogical model because it didn't it has um, parameters outside their bounds. And so you'll see that um, it still like will give me all these numbers. And so you have to be careful not to interpret these kind of models, but to only use them for diagnostic purposes. Okay. So I might suggest or figure out that, well, maybe these are just too correlated at all. Um, in the model, and so I should collapse and go down to a one-factor model. Okay. And so maybe that's my problem, is it's just too close to one no matter what. Okay. Um, because that's the only real thing that I see here, um, is that this is over one. So let's maybe try collapsing into one latent variable and see what happens. 
Sometimes you'll see that one of the standard errors is really large and that's where the problem is, but in our case, none of these are super large. Just to kind of tell you, like, what do I do if this happens? Here. Nope. Nope. Third times, eighth times the charm. Where did it go? Did I close it? Sorry, see your question here. Can we go over quickly what the difference is between standardized LV and standardized all? Yes. Here's the life chance. Let me go back to here. All right. So standard uh, our our traditional procedure is to um, standardize on a marker variable, right? So we set one of these to one. So let's make a quick simplot. Oops. Oh, oh, it's sim paths. My fault. Sorry. It's Wednesday. What are you doing, computer? Family dot fit. This is why I don't live code very often. Okay, so what we've done normally is set one of these to one. I don't know why this looks so bad. Um, there it goes. Right. So we've, the dotted line here indicates that we have set that as our scaling or our marker variable. And that just gives the, essentially, it doesn't z-score the, the model, but it, it gives the model um, place to scale. So a compared to a 1, the predictor in this equation is 0.3 or whatever. The other option for scaling and identification purposes. So the other thing this does, right, is it controls the degrees of freedom, right? The other option is to move the scaling to the latent variables. So instead of setting this pathway to one, we would set the latent variable variance to one. And that just constrains the amount of variance the latent variable has, which then determines what the paths can be. So that's standardized LV. The coefficient in our um, example, in the printout here, is if I standardize sort of, it doesn't, it's not really standardization, but it's if I use my marker variable um, on one of the paths, standardized LV is if, if I mark instead on the latent variable by switching the one pathway to the variance. Standardized all is when you basically z-score the entire model. So it standardizes based on the latent variable variance and the manifest variable variance. And so the standardized all solution is really nice because you get paths for all of them. Right? Um, but this one accounts for the manifest variable variance. And they're very subtle in this. Um, is this our valid one? Okay, that is our not valid one. Let's look at a, a valid one real quick. Stand, standardize. This is true. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, they're usually pretty, it's pretty subtle in this case because we're using a correlation matrix. Okay. So um, because it's a correlation matrix, these are going to be very similar. If it's raw data or covariances, they, they might be very pretty different. Because we're kind of double standardizing by using a correlation matrix. <clears throat> Did that answer your question? There's one more type, remember, standardized NOx, which is standardizing only on the observed variables, variances, no exogenous variable variances. So the per per preferred reporting one, that's a great question. I almost always use standardized all because that at least allows me to compare between maybe your model and my model because we've kind of z-score to the whole thing, right? So I'm using a z-score as the example here. That's not quite how it works, but, you know, normalizing is what we're doing. And so we're normalizing on the latent variable, right? So it's like sort of normalizing on the coefficient on the latent variable or both. And so most people pick the both because that makes this a correlation okay, between latent variables and it makes these um, similar to correlations, kind of like EFA, right? When we have that rule of 
um, if it's 0.3, it's considered a good loading. We can apply that rule here too because now they're in the same scale. <coughs> Excuse me. Good. Cool. <laughs> so there are there are three different ways to really standardize, but most people pick all. And I think mostly because of comparison reasons. So I can look at look at your variables and go, okay, I know what that means. Um, where were we at? Back to over here. All right, so it doesn't matter if it's core or code. Model's still no good. Right? So we can't really we can't really make this model any better. We should probably throw it in the trash and start over. Now I just made a quick diagram of the good one, and. Uh, this is printing out standardized all right? because I, latent variable variance like as long as it's not crazy it's not really a, maybe an interesting question but the loadings are usually something people are interested in right? so these all load pretty well and then the error variance are usually we're very interested in like how much of this are we predicting so these are kind of like r squared reverse of r squared values all right so this models this one's a good mo uh, fit because the error variance is low and this one is the worst one. So it's hard to fit this variable because the error variance is higher. There's no particular scale for those. Okay, actually that might be scaled to one. So not very good over there. <clears throat> now with my terrible model, <laughs> let's switch from covariance between adjust and family to now predicted direction. So all I have to do to convert now to my um, full model is add a new line. And because we're forcing the prediction direction, we're going to go back to path models, essentially, and add this just a single tilde. Okay, so adjust is predicted by family. So the family situation is going to predict marital adjustment okay, in our proposed model here. And this one actually does run okay because the last one ran okay and it shouldn't change much because all we've done is go from covariance to a straight prediction so we'll get a little bit of of some number movement here not a whole lot this one maybe not at all and we really shouldn't see any changes here in our measurement model that would be a bad sign and since we only have one predictor here, the whole this this actually does not change <laughs> because we just have one regression that we're we're moving from co covariance. I'm sorry, we're moving from correlation to regression, but in a completely standardized solution, one x and one y regression is correlation. Okay, so this one doesn't change at all. So why do this if it doesn't change? Well, in this scenario, it's really just stating your theory. It's not that adjustment and family stuff is related. We're saying that the um, adjustment is caused by the family stuff. In other models, you, you'll you have them change a little bit because you're predicting a certain set of directions. But we're going to start with a simple one and a model that would break so you could see what happens when they break. And then I might just di oops, diagram that one and it will give you a slightly different picture when they are predictive. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> this double horseshoe here is like totally overlapping, um, but you can see mostly hasn't changed. So let's try composite variables and a more complex model. Okay. So what we've got here is this composite variable of risk, where we have a low socioeconomic family, um, per parental psychiatric issues, and verbal IQ, whatever that might be. Um, B, high or low, whatever. And that composite wise creates risk for, for children. Okay, so low socioeconomic status. Um, so that might be a yes or no kind of variable. Um, psychiatric issues and their verbal IQ score will all lead into this risk. So if these are all um, on the bad range, we would expect risk to be high. And that's a composite variable. Notice the direction of the arrows. We're using that then to predict their achievement levels, reading, math, and spelling, and their classroom adjustment. 
motivation, harmony, and stability. There are a lot of family examples in the Klein book. So this one again is from Klein. Mm -hmm. So since it's a textbook example, I have um, the covariance correlation set up, which we've seen like 100 times now. So we'll kind of swift, swiftly go through this part. But um, you know, it would be better if we had the raw data. I think in later editions, he might have the raw data. Um, but the good thing about Levon is we can go from work with this in either direction. So let's build that model. And as a reminder, like how do I define a composite variable? Because we've been doing equals tilde for our latent variables, and that's exogenous. To do endogenous, we do the less than symbol tilde to create our composite variables. Now remember that composite variables will cost you degrees of freedom. Okay, so a lot, a lot of times if you're going to use these, because they have their place, um, you just have to kind of struggle with getting them to identify. So what we're done here is we've taken risk is composed of the SES, parental, psych, and verbal. And then we've got our two our measurement model component okay, of our achievements, reading, math, and spelling, and adjustment is motivation, harmony, and stability. Okay. And then this piece is the more interesting one, and you'll see this on the assignment. But so let me back up. <clears throat> Here, there's two ways to sort of define this. In a sense, this structural component here is a little mini measurement model because we have one latent variable predicting others. So if I took off the top and hit it, I was about to like cover the screen because you guys could see that, you know, it's just blocking my face. But anyways, um, if I hid the top from you here and just looked at the bottom, this looks very familiar from last week, hopefully. All right, that's a hierarchical CFA. And we're defining risk now, though, instead of being just some latent variable, it's defined by these measurement components. Okay, by these, I'm sorry, composite. These are composites. So there's two ways that we can do this. We can say um, achievement tilde risk, right? So y is predicted by x, and classroom adjustment tilde risk. Or we can sort of treat this like a little mini measurement CFA component. So we say risk equals tilde, achievement and adjustment. The good thing about doing it the way I have it in here, this, this version, is that you have to scale the structural model and identify the structural model. And sometimes if um, the two plus admitted paths rule, right, if they don't have at least two arrows going out, and sometimes even if you do, um, they blow up. And by blow up, I mean they just don't run. <laughs> you'll get this non-identified message. So you'll see on the, the practice assignment, um, we're fo we'll force this to happen. And then it says, oh no, here's the solution. And this is the solution to set it up as an equals tilde rather than two separate y predicted by x lines. Um, so I'm just trying to show, like, we're really now getting a lot more, too, into, like, errors and how do I fix them? Because they will happen. No model's, no model's perfect, and if it is, you should be suspicious. All right, so there's two ways to define this. We're going to go with this way because it runs. On the assignment, you'll do both ways to see that it doesn't run. All right, analyze that model. Nothing new here. Let's see what happens. First rule, Haywood cases. So let's scroll. Any, um, now these can be negative, so that's fine. Come down here to variances. Any negative variances? Nope. Okay, this one is zero, but that's because it's a composite variable. Um, any correlations or R squareds over one? Nope. And then there are no correlations in this model. So check. <laughs> right? So no, no real problems any standard errors that are super huge no now the standard error of the variances will be larger but this is not they're all fairly consistent in size because right? um, that's the scale of the data all right so that looks good so let's see if the model's any good let's look at fit 
scroll, 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 scroll. So, mixed bag. One okay, one not. Rim C is not okay. SRMR is. So our sort of traditional half and half. So we might see where we can improve this model by looking at modification indices. Let's see if we have any bad paths. All these look good. Right, so all these load pretty well together. And our, our risk does predict um, achievement and adjustment pretty well. Now when we come down here to our composites, this is where we can start to see what's what maybe is going on in the model. So is this a good composite? Okay, good composites have the same sort of rules as, as good measurement models. They should predict their latent variable in this case because the prediction is the other way. Okay. So um, just like with our like adjustment here, we want all three of these to be good measurements of adjustment. So adjustment is predicting them and they're strongly related to their latent variable. Same rules here, we still want them to be strongly related to the latent variable, but this time that measured variable is predicting the latent. And these two items are not giving us anything good. So first of all, they're non-significant, which is hard to do in these models. And they're very close to zero. And so I would imagine if we printed out the parameter estimates, it would include zero. So if a confidence interval are on our parameter estimate includes zero, that implies that the true parameter may be zero, which really means that these two variables are not helping us with our composite. Okay. Now the verbal one is carrying all the weight. Okay, that is a very strong standardized coefficient, and it's really what's doing the work here. So what should I really do with this model? Well, my suggestion, knowing, knowing what I've seen, is to ditch these two variables completely and just use verbal IQ in place of all this whole top. So it's actually verbal IQ that's predicting achievement and adjustment in this particular model. Having this be a composite variable is not helping. Go back here. So these are not doing us any good. All right, so that being said, maybe I can look at the improvements on the model. And there really aren't any that are super strong. So anything below three is definitely not worth looking at. But here we have risk predicting spelling. Okay, well, it kind of predicts spelling through the secondary latent variable, so that doesn't make sense. Reading and math as a correlated error term kind of makes sense. Risk Correlating with achievement, maybe not so much sense. So, so nothing super useful here. Okay. Um, so I would say that mostly the modification indices don't give us anything, and we should focus on um, maybe changing the way the model's laid out instead. So this will be the drop non-significant paths part. And so I did a, a diagram of that, and I can just really see, like, these two are... I'm, I'm losing all of these degrees of freedom for two variables that don't do me any good. All right, so I've lost one, two, three, four, five, if I can count, five degrees of freedom, six, seven degrees of freedom by estimating the variances, all of these covariances, and these two paths for two variables that are, like, totally not working. So instead of losing all of that, just take verbal, move it right here, and use it to predict directly instead. Now, by doing that, I would have to do the regression style because you can't make this variable a, a latent variable. So I would have to do achievement is predicted by verbal and adjustment is predicted by verbal. Yeah, I couldn't use my uh, latent variable hack. But down here, this part of the model is looking pretty good. So it's really the structural, the composite part that's not so good. All right, so let's summarize all that up. We have expanded now to the complete CFA set until we get to multi-group models. So now we've worked and we've taken all that stuff from path modeling and applied it to CFAs. So this kind of builds everything that we've done all semester into one component. 
And so we went back and talked about where, how do we actually do composite variables because you might have a need for them and how we run those models. In general, I think you can see probably I have a small disdain for them because there's so much work and um, they don't tend to r run well. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they're illogical. They might make a lot of sense to use. Um, but the trade-off is the issues with identification and degrees of freedom. And then how to think about invariance. So we don't, when we add those structural components, we really don't want the measurement part to change very much, if at all. 